this one's a, a pretty good example. Anyone know what this is? For one thing, at low power, cellular neoplasm and necrosis is malignant 99.9% .9 of the time, right? That's a Dr. Rowe beginner rule. This big zonal necrosis. Yes, this is pleomorphic liposome, but wait, it's not spindled. Is that okay? Yes, it's okay. I'll tell you, because I, since I already said it was the answer. Yeah, you get multi-loculated, multi-vacuolated pleomorphic lipoblasts of varying size, but all of the cells you see have round nuclei and abundant cytoplasm. And even the ones without good vacuoles have kind of a frothy, foamy cytoplasm that you can tell looks kind of xanthomatous looking. Like you can tell there's lipid in there, even though it's not formed into nice big bubbles. And then let me see, there was a good area with really good lipoblasts here, if I recall. Yeah, there we go. I mean, that's textbook, right? The perfect lipoblasts with the clear vacuoles and they're pushing in on the nucleus and denting the nucleus. So an important thing to remember is that pleomorphic liposarcoma, it's the one liposarcoma that you must have at least one pleomorphic lipoblast to make the diagnosis. If you don't, then what you're left with is high-grade sarcoma, UPS basically, right? The thing that makes it recognizable as liposarcoma is the presence of pleomorphic lipoblasts. Other liposarcs can have lipoblasts, and you can watch the full liposarc video if you want. Um, to learn more about that, but the one that must have it to meet diagnostic criteria is pleomorphic liposarc. There are two main patterns, and there's a lot of variability. I, I've seen a wide range of features in pleomorphic liposarcoma, but the two main groups that you can think of them in, and it's purely a morphologic, I don't think there's any real behavior difference that we've discovered, is they either look like cellular spindle cell pleomorphic neoplasms, or they can be sheets of epithelioid cells, okay? So I think it's important to know this because a lot of people are more familiar with the pleomorphic spindle one that looks like undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma, but this doesn't look anything like undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma, right? This looks like adrenocortical carcinoma or something. And I think that's one thing. It would be weird to have a 10 centimeter thigh mass that was metastatic adrenocortical carcinoma in a patient with no known primary, right? That would be strange. But I mean, I do feel like um, there is some certainly some morphologic similarity there. And also in cases that don't have as much of the, the bubbly foamy cytoplasm, they can just be like sheets of epithelioid cells and only have scattered lipoblasts. And those could be confused with a wide variety of other epithelioid tumors, either soft tissue epithelioid tumors or carcinomas even. And so I think it's a, an important thing to keep in mind um, uh, because, uh, yeah, because it's a, it's a rare entity among liposarcs. Pleomorphic liposarc is the, the rarest of the main subtypes of liposarc. It represents about 5% or so of liposarcomas. Um, and uh, again, this is a, a relatively uncommon morphologic variant of pleomorphic liposarc. So they're not all going to be this sheet-like, but, but do keep in mind you can have ones that are totally packed full of bubbly lipoblasts and other ones that only have rare lipoblasts in a kind of a cellular sheet-like epithelioid background. Sometimes you can have both areas together, epithelioid transitioning into spindle. And also, I feel like the nuclei of pleomorphic liposarcoma are among the most ugly, nasty, huge pleomorphic nuclei of any tumor in the human body. Um, I feel, and this one doesn't begin to come close to some I've seen. I, I've tweeted some before. Uh, just to show examples of these insane nuclei that are so massive. So when I see a sarcoma with super, super bizarre nuclei, like stuff that makes this look tame, that I always, even though it's not a diagnostic criterion, I've just seen so many cases of these that had really bizarre nuclei that I hunt extra hard for lipoblasts. And remember, if you call something an undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma and you miss the fact that there was a lipoblast there, the treatment for the patient is going to be the same. High-grade adult sarcomas in general are treated with wide local excision and radiation therapy oftentimes, and sometimes they discuss chemotherapy, even though we don't have really any good targeted chemotherapy that works for most of the adult pleomorphic sarcomas. Now, some subtypes of things like mixoid liposarc have specialized therapy. Pediatric sarcomas and round blue cell sarcomas get their own special therapy, so recognizing those is very important. But among the different pleomorphic adult sarcomas, pleomorphic lyomyosarcoma, Pleomorphic rhabdomyosarcoma, even. Pleomorphic liposarc. Undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma, which years and years ago was called MFH. And hopefully you all know by now that we should never, ever do that anymore. It's a, a, a obsolete name. Well, all of those sarcomas, even though they have differences in prognosis, they are treated basically the same. And I hope one day that we come up with targeted therapies that work. But to my knowledge right now, we don't have good proven targeted therapies to separate those out. Even pleomorphic rhabdo, 
I believe that it's no, it normally occurs in adults, and my understanding is it's usually treated like other adult high-grade sarcomas rather than by pediatric rhabdo protocols, which alveolar rhabdo and, and brinal rhabdo um, get treated totally a special way. Um, and um, but Van Hung, um, is, with his pediatric path mastery, can teach you all about that. Um, but anyway, this is a, just a reason to point that out is sometimes we get real angsty over subtyping high-grade adult sarcomas. And it's, it's unfortunately at this point still a lot more of an academic exercise than one that makes an actual actionable difference for individual patients. Um, that said, pleomorphic liposarc, about 50% five-year survival. It's pretty aggressive. It's a nasty tumor. And um, it metastasizes the lungs and often does so within the first five years. Um, and that's different from DDIP liposarc, which can look very ugly also, but actually has a, it seems to be a slower growing tumor, although when it's in the retroperitoneum, uh, much more um, uh, in the long run, a higher mortality rate. Most everyone dies. Most of the people die from it eventually if they live long enough. Okay. Oh, the last thing I would point out is that in general, if you see a sarcoma in the extremities, lipoblasts, that is going to be pleomorphic liposarcoma the vast majority of the time. DDIP can sometimes have lipoblasts, but the most common place for DDIP liposarcoma to arise is retroperitoneum, although I've seen a handful of them in the extremities. So if you really want to know, you can do MDM2, which is almost always negative in this tumor and almost always positive in DDIP liposarcoma. Okay, that's enough. You can, you can watch the other liposarcoma video if you want more stuff along those lines. Oh, yes, yes. You must have a lipoblast to make a diagnosis of pleomorphic liposarcoma. There's, I mean... Oh, no, so that, yeah, that's a little more complicated. The, the, the general rule in the past, what we said, and, and the, that liposarcoma 101 video goes into this in depth, but the general, the easy, it was easy in the old days because the book said, the WHO book said, if it has lipoblasts, it's pleomorphic liposarc, an ugly tumor, ugly high-grade sarcoma with lipoblasts, it's pleomorphic liposarc. DDIP liposarc does not have lipoblasts. And that was so simple then. And then in the 90s, the Dr. Fletcher reported some cases and Dr. Weiss's group reported some cases of things that were retroperitoneal, uh, sometimes had well dip and then high grade sarcoma. So clearly looked like DDIP, but had lipoblasts and they had the pattern of a pleomorphic liposarcoma. And then with MDM2 testing, what we found is that those tumors all tested positive for MDM2. So we now, what we now know is that DDIP liposarc usually does not have lipoblasts, but a subset of cases at around 10 or 20%, the books say 20%, that seems a little high, but maybe so. About 20% of cases do have lipoblasts. So it's unfortunate. It used to be so easy to teach this, um, and now it's the waters have gotten muddy. The well, For learning for residents, high-grade sarcoma with lipoblasts is pleomorphic liposarc. High-grade sarcoma with no lipoblasts arising next to a well dip or arising in the retroperitoneum, that's DDIP liposarc. But recognize that in practice, there are some exceptions to that rule where DDIP does acquire lipoblasts. And to really solve it, you can do MDM2. Um, but uh, in the retroperitoneum, this tumor almost never occurs in the retroperitoneum. And in fact, I would never believe this tumor, if it were in the retroperitoneum, I would say that it's either adrenocortical or it's a, a DDIP liposarc that has lipoblasts. What we call that is homologous lipoblastic differentiation. And I realize it's a confusing term. It's like the idea is that the DDIP like lost all of its fatty differentiation and then re-differentiated. I think Liz Montgomery has told me that's the way she thinks of it is re-differentiating it's a DDIF that's like growing back towards being fatty. It's a little hard to wrap your head around, I think, at first. But anyway, I hope that that helped a little bit and didn't make it more confusing. But I admit it is confusing. So you're welcome. But yeah, go check out that other video. And I think I explained it a little better in there because I had some slides and kind of made my points in a more structured fashion, hopefully.